substance use disorder during uh, the COVID uh, 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 pandemic. Uh, and let's see, we've got, um, first we've got, uh, let me just get my notes. Kelly Namora is going to speak as well as Brad Finegood. Kelly is the division director for the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division in King County's DCHS. Um, that division provides oversight for mental health and substance use disorder prevention, intervention, and treatment with a focus on recovery and management of mental illness and drug dependency behavioral health sales tax revenues, a, a tax that I was uh, very proud to be the uh, prime sponsor of in 2015 when it came back before the King County Council. Under her leadership, Kelly has uh, taken on the role of managing and coordinating the King County Integrated Care Network of Providers, enhancing consumer choice for behavioral health services countywide, and taking on direct responsibility for serving as the administrative service organization for the region responsible for the coordination of the county's uh, response services and access to care. So that's Kelly, welcome Kelly. And then Brad Finegood is a strategic advisor at public health in Seattle and King County. He has served as co-chair of the King County Heroin and Prescription Opioid Task Force. Brad has worked in the behavioral health field for 20 years in both substance use disorder and mental health services and administration. He has provided direct service in multiple modalities, including prevention, outpatient, residential and medicated assistant treatment both in institutions and in the community. And I think uh, very importantly, he is the sibling and survivor of a younger sibling that passed away as a result of an overdose. So Brad, thanks for being here to share. I'm so glad both of you are here. Uh, I, I will just say, um, when I first put this conference together, I was hoping for something like 30 to 50 people perhaps to participate. We have, uh, nearly 200 people who have registered for this conference and and i'm so so glad it, it it tells me that there's you know continues to be a very substantial need in the services we are discussing so kelly and brad take it away thanks for being here thank you so much uh council member dunn i uh, really appreciate it so excited to be here today thank you for the invitation to join this wonderful conversation um and I just really want to thank you for your courage to share your story and uh, share with us your experience, because it is so important for all of us to know that this, this is about all of us. Uh, and um, thank you also for your interest in hosting this, because it's an important conversation. And uh, I hope you said at the beginning, this is the first annual one, and I hope to uh, see many, many more in the years to come. So thank you so much, Council Member. Um, I'm actually going to turn this over to Brad because I think Brad is going to start the uh, presentation. So Brad and I have worked together for many years and together we hope we'll be providing you some background on um, substance use disorder information as well as I'll be talking more about how to access services. So I'll turn this over to my esteemed colleague Brad and then we'll join in a few moments. Thanks Brad. Thanks so much Kelly, appreciate it. Uh, Brad Feingood, everybody, Public Health, Seattle, King County. Um, I feel like I'm gonna be the Debbie Downer with a little bit of my information because there's so much stories of recovery and hope that's being shared here today. You know, by council member Don uh, putting on this conference and sharing his voice um, to the conversation about recovery, that is the first step in demystifying substance use disorder and allaying stigma around why people uh, are afraid to uh, receive care um, and open those opportunities and those pathways for so many people. So thank you so much, Council Member Dunn, um, for doing that. Um, you, as one of the, I can also say, as one of the 1,800 people that attended the King County Recovery Coalition Day at the Mariners, I could say because of the 1,800 people that showed up to support the Mariners, that we were able to outnumber the Blue Jays fans. So that was also really good. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So we at Public Health Seattle King County take a lot of pride in making um, information public to uh, information transparent to the public um, at King County. That is a, a value that is that is put across the whole county, uh, whether departments like Leo's and Kelly's and Human Services um, 
or whether in public health, we want to make sure that people have access to information about what is going on in the community. If you go to kingcounty.gov backslash overdose, that's our landing page for all things overdose prevention um, and understanding what is going on in the community. So what you're seeing is um, one of our dashboards that's available under the data dashboards sub tab on kingcounty.gov backslash overdose that talks about the number of overdoses year over year that we've experienced and what they are. When you go to the uh, dashboard, it's more interactive and you can hover over it and get specific numbers. But I will point to you that um, in 2020, which three quarters of 2020 was dominated by COVID, we had by far and away our highest number of drug overdoses um, in King County year over year ever. Um, and that number went up by over 100. Um, and that number, that 100 increase is larger than any increase we've ever had. We've never had an increase larger than 30 some odd um, people overdosing year over year. And now, and let me just say, that's new individuals who are dying. Those aren't on top of last year's numbers. And so we continue to experience and to see more and more people dying of substance related overdose year over year uh, than ever before. The numbers are um, continuing to grow and they're, um, in addition, they are, they have impacts on different racial ethnic categories um, and have distinct disparities. If you can forward the slide. As you can see uh, here, uh, white individuals are the vast majority of people who are dying of drug overdose. But the increase, um, this is the increase in the first six months of 2019 to 2020 is super significant in uh, and more distinct in uh, communities of color. So American Indian, Alaska Native um, individuals, the number went up 169% in the first six months of 2020 versus the six months of 2019. And these are statewide numbers. Um, Black individuals up 91% and Latinx or Hispanic people have went up 115%. So the amount of people that are growing, the impact on um, disparities of communities of color is tremendous. And as we know, um, as racism is a public health crisis that the county uh, has adopted um, and through council and executive, we also know that that has implication in so many different areas. You can forward to the next slide. So why is drug overdose increasing in our county? Well, there's two primary factors that are um, contributing to the increase in overdose deaths. Um, if you go to our dashboard, again, you can see these numbers and isolate on different uh, substances. But the two primary substances that are driving increased death, um, the first one is stimulants. So uh, methamphetamine overdose deaths, you can see in 2010, methamphetamine overdose deaths um, there were about 18, only about 18 people who died a decade ago with methamphetamine in their system at the time of overdose death. That number has been steadily increasing um, and is now at 236. Um, back a decade ago, methamphetamine was primarily uh, increased in, um, uh, I'm sorry, was primarily produced locally. Um, pseudofedrin was being used to uh, make and concoct uh, methamphetamine and sold here locally. Um, there were, were so many great laws enacted to counter that. And what's happened is that methamphetamine is now being produced in other areas, primarily in Mexico and being shipped up north of the border. And this is something that we are seeing not just in King County, but is going on uh, nationwide. There's a great article in the New York Times today um, about the increase in drug overdose deaths um, and uh, the contribution to that for, by methamphetamine and uh, fentanyl that we'll talk about. The other thing I'll say about methamphetamine, different than heroin, fentanyl, and prescription opioids, is there is no silver bullet treatment. We have um, some really good treatments for opioids like heroin, fentanyl, and prescription opioids. But for stimulants, we don't have any silver bullet uh, medications that, that help um, significantly. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
The, the other um, big driver of overdose deaths, and this is the one that uh, is uh, we. I'm going to talk a lot about in this presentation, and I'm going to talk more about this afternoon is fentanyl. So fentanyl is a um, is normally comes in a there's a prescription form of fentanyl. It's a very uh, it's a very uh, go back one for a second, please. Um, uh, that uh, fentanyl comes uh, it, pharmaceutically comes and is quite, and has a high degree of quality assurance used in surgeries. Um, and fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin as a drug. You can see here the number of people that have died with fentanyl in their system has gone up from three just five years ago to 175 in 2020, I guess six years ago now. Um, so that number is just increasing exponentially. And unfortunately, and honestly, due to the supply that's coming in to the region, we expect that number to keep going up. Um, you can go to the next slide now, sorry. Um, fentanyl is primarily coming in the form of, what, of counterfeit pills. So as you see here, these uh, blue M30 pills, you will never be able to tell what is fake and what is real as far as um, as far as a counterfeit pill goes. So these pills are coming in again, primarily from Mexico. The precursors are coming in often from China, go, uh, being sent to Mexico, being uh, pressed in Mexico and sent north of the border. And they're coming in in batches and batches and batches. Um, the um, It's fentanyl, this non- uh, legal fentanyl is being added to these pills. The tricky thing is, is M30 pills, if you were to get it from the doctor, are pretty safe. They're like oxycodone or Percocet. Um, and so they're pretty safe. But the ones that are coming um, up from, that are counterfeit up from, uh, up, up from the South are extremely lethal. They're not oxycodone. Two specks of fentanyl um, will drop people dead. We've, we have stories of people in King County uh, splitting a pill and um, at a family barbecue and both people dying. The, the tragedies um, with fentanyl are many. You can go uh, to the next slide. It's coming in, so this is, uh, so Seattle PD, um, a number of, uh, so two years ago, Seattle, uh, in 2018, Seattle PD um, seized about 500-ish of these pills. Um, Two years ago in 2019, it was about a quarter million pills. Um, and of those uh, approximately quarter million pills that they seized, about 98% of those were fake and had fentanyl in it. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a dangerous, dangerous thing that's everywhere. You can go to the next slide. Um, last year, uh, during the time of COVID, there were some huge, huge seizures of uh, these fentanyl pills. Uh, $23 million worth of fentanyl in the Snohomish region, 6.5 million worth of fentanyl seized, seized in, uh, in, a, in a traffic stop uh, in Snoqualmie. So just so much of these, uh, of the supply is, um, is really, it's not just our region, but it's all up and down the West Coast. Uh, you can keep going. So one of the, the other thing that I, that one of the other things that's important to understand about the fentanyl overdose deaths is um, it's, it looks very different when you're looking at who is dying um, across our community. Um, I know that uh, council member Dunn's district um, is in the Southeast part of, of the county. Um, of note, when you look at all drug overdose deaths, there's a high concentration in the city of Seattle. Um, the, on the map, I guess, if you're looking at it on the left, um, the orange dots are non-fentanyl related deaths. So you can see that cluster really um, in the city. But when you um, take out non-fentanyl related deaths and you look at only fentanyl related deaths, it's extremely geographically spread. We're seeing it all across the county. Uh, East County, South County um, is just as impacted by fentanyl overdose deaths um, as the rest of the county. You can um, go forward. The other thing to know is that fentanyl overdose death is impacting a younger and younger group. And if you think about why, um, it's really because People, uh, people who are taking pills, um, often it's they feel safer. There's less stigma related because they don't need needles to use or they don't need to smoke or, or snore, although people are doing that occasionally too. 
but um, but there's a, there's a lower threshold for use. And so younger and younger people traditionally associated with like early experimental drug use as uh, council member Dunn talked about the escalation of his drinking. Often we see that people may start with um, with drugs that they don't feel threatened by. And when they see a pill um, that they believe to be possibly from a doctor or a pharmacy, they uh, very much um, feel safer taking it. So um, you'll see that uh, people under 40, um, uh, when uh, fentanyl involved deaths, um, about 75% of the people are under the age of 40, but with non fentanyl involved deaths, uh, the majority of people are over the age of 40. And when you look at teenagers, so these are our school age children uh, in the county uh, of the fentanyl involved deaths, 11% of those are teenagers versus non fentanyl involved deaths, with it, which is just 1% of the population. Um, you can go to the next slide. So when we look at year over year, um, the, the uh, proportion of overdose deaths that are related to fentanyl versus non-fentanyl, you'll see a very changing trend where, uh, where we've almost flattened out when you look at non-fentanyl related deaths. We actually in 2019 had less non-fentanyl related deaths than 2018. So a lot of the interventions that we've been uh, turning out throughout the years are, are showing promise. Um, and I know that Kelly's gonna talk about the behavioral health system and, um, and those services um, and treatment. And then next up is Caleb Bantagreen and he'll talk a little bit about some of that work too. Um, but you'll see that fentanyl is really a significant game changer from us. Very different than what we've heard for years and years around East Coast fentanyl, where it's very much mixed in the drugs. We really haven't seen that as much here, although we've seen little bits of it, but we've really seen it in the form of those um, prescription overdose, uh, prescription counterfeit prescription pills. So um, that is some of the information about what we've been dealing with during COVID with the increase in fentanyl related deaths um, during COVID the increase in drug overdose deaths uh, marginally overall. Um, and I am happy to uh, stop being the Debbie Downer and turn it back over to Kelly to talk about the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division and the King County Integrated Care Network and all the amazing work that they're doing. Thank you, Brad. Thank you for that information. It's always good information to know and to track. So appreciate the public health um, um, concise tracking and reporting of all that information. It's so valuable for us to know. Um, again, I'm Kelly Nomura, the Director of the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division here at King County. And just a couple words about the Behavioral Health and Recovery Division. Um, we are a part, as Leo Floor mentioned, of the Department of Community and Human Services. And um, our primary objective, our goals every day, is to um, oversee and manage the administration of mental health and substance use disorder services for, and programs for low-income individuals in King County. And we do that by contracting directly with the behavioral health providers across all of the communities in King County to provide behavioral health services and treatment. And we also perform delegated administrative functions on behalf of the five Medicaid managed care plans in King County. Um, so we're just really honored to be able to be part of this work every day, supporting our communities, supporting our behavioral health providers, and making sure, as you've heard today, access to care and treatment is available and that we are all working together to promote recovery. Next slide, please. Um, you've heard about some of the challenges during COVID um, and in particular for the substance use community, those that are, those that are suffering and, and needing support. Um, you can imagine that back in uh, about a year ago in March of 2020, when we all received the statewide stay at home order, how much that impacted the behavioral health system, because we are a system of um, contact and support. We are a system where um, individuals receive their services in person with counselors and medical providers. And for us to all have to stay home to be safe, we understood that, we all followed that, and we're so grateful that the communities did that. But it really did impact the behavioral health system and our ability to continue to stay in contact with individuals that needed help. One of the things that my, my team did very um, quickly was start tracking and coordinating across the behavioral health providers um, the changes that that resulted in for them. Um, some of them had to close down temporarily some of their treatment sites. Some of them had to adjust their office hours, um, mainly because of, as with, with most industries, 
um, the staff and the workers of those agencies uh, were also needing to stay home. So we weren't able to have as many face-to-face -face contacts. But we've been tracking that over the course of 2020 and well into 2021, making sure that as things change, as vaccination distribution in increases, as the CDC guidelines change, we are working with all the behavioral health providers to um, return to uh, being able to support the community both in person, but also continuing the addition of telehealth and telemedicine services. All of the behavioral health providers moved very quickly to seeing individuals virtually and through video conferencing. We know that it is not uh, a, a replacement for in-person care, but it has certainly helped us be able to stay in touch with those individuals that can use telehealth and telemedicine services. So we're consistently tracking that to make sure that we're aware of what is available and encouraging providers to um, uh, continue to open up their services and return to being able to see people in person. Uh, as as um, Leo mentioned earlier, we know we're not going to get back to the exact same way things may have been um, provided uh, prior to COVID, but we are working very hard to make sure that, that services are accessible. Uh, one of the other things we did was um, provide significant behavioral health response at the King County isolation and quarantine settings that have been in place now for over a year. And that's really important because for individuals who are staying there, whether it was 10 days or 14 days, either being exposed to COVID or having um, COVID positive results, um, that can be a very isolating experience to stay in a place for that long with no contact with others, um, not feeling well, and knowing that you, you, know, you, need, you need some support and medical support uh, we brought in significant behavioral health response to those settings, uh, bringing in well over 100 behavioral health staff from all around the community. Um, and, and we just appreciate those behavioral health uh, frontline workers who came to work every day and supported the work at the quarantine settings. We know that because of COVID, uh, many individuals in our communities lost their jobs, therefore losing their income. And so we've seen an increase in Medicaid eligible individuals all across King County. We are monitoring that and again, making sure that because of that, we are um, ensuring open access to services when they're needed. And as, as mentioned several times, all of this has resulted in an increased need for mental health and addiction support and treatment. Next slide. One of the things that we wanna make sure and do is that, um, and you can just keep yeah, adding those, thank you. <clears throat> um, there you go is that across our system of care, regardless of what type of service you're in for substance use treatment, uh, we have system values that all of our providers and here at King County, we, we believe in and we support and we promote. And first and foremost is that all services are person-centered. As you've heard from council member Dunn, you've heard from Heather and others who are in recovery. It is so important to recognize that everybody's situation, everybody's story is different. And so we have to be very person-centered in providing that support. We also have to be very collaborative because we want to make sure that communication is happening across our uh, 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 providers who are supporting that individual, but also across the provide that individual's network and support system. We have to make sure we're aware of what um, collaboration is needed and strong communication. We make sure that care is always individualized. As I said, it's important to recognize that this is a person in front of us who is needing our help. And we're not gonna just bring um, traditional um, CAN services to, to uh, offer that individual. It has to be individualized for success and for that person to feel supported. And it needs to be in a least restrictive environment. We want that person in community-based services close to where they wish to be served um, and um, in an environment that's very supportive. Services always have to be culturally relevant to the individuals. And as you've heard about already today, um, we are all coming from a recovery and resiliency oriented system of care. Recovery can happen. Recovery does happen. Recovery does work. Services and treatment works and recovery does happen. So those are the overall system values that all of our providers and here at King County, we are um, every day making sure that we are um, promoting and incorporating in the services that we provide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I, I, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about the different services, the continuum of SDD care that we have. But I think if there's one thing that I hope for 
anyone who may be looking for services or for someone else can remember from today's presentation is that we are here to help you. We are here to support you getting into services. And so we have a client services line that is available. And in partnership with the 24 hour line of the Washington Recovery Helpline here, um, we wanna make sure you know who to call when you might have questions about our service array, how to access them, or if you're having challenges in getting into services, please know that there are staff on the end of these phone lines that are available to support you and help you. We want to be there to help you and help manage and maneuver the system. We know that it can be confusing and overwhelming at times. So, so let us help you with that uh, whenever you have any questions. Next slide, please. So this is the continuum of SUD services here. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to go over each one of these very quickly. Um, but um, the main thing I want to make sure everyone is aware of is this is a continuum. We have a variety of ways to get into treatment and different types of treatment. But recovery is a linear process. And as you heard council member Dunn say, um, sometimes it takes many times in treatment for it to be successful. For some people it's one time and for others it's multiple. So we are not gonna judge. We don't, we don't judge anyone who may need to move in between these types of services. We are just so happy and we celebrate when they're in treatment and they're, they are able to get the support they need. And then we come and support when they may be struggling and need to get re-engaged with treatment. Um, and we, we are not gonna give up on individuals as they go through this process. It's a very fluid process and we're here to help those, uh, all of you that, that are in this situation and need treatment go through this together. Next slide. This is just a real quick graph of um, the SUD services in District 9. So um, we have a link where you can choose, if you go into the, the website, you can choose maybe outpatient services, and then the, the um, balloons for outpatient locations will show up. This map picture is showing you all of them lit up, um, but you'll be able to go in and you can look at where anything in the District 9 area is located. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about outpatient services. Outpatient is really, um, it, it is very uh, uh, easy to access outpatient SUD services here in King County. Um, we have a multiple uh, array of providers. Uh, many people think of when they think of outpatient SUD is, you know, you go in for an assessment and then you start doing individual counseling or group services. And that is absolutely true. But I wanted to make sure you were aware of all of the other resources that one has available to them when they are enrolled and engaged in outpatient services. Many of these things are um, services people may not be aware of. Um, and we wanna make sure that you're aware of all of the different resources as you engage in treatment. When you are in outpatient treatment, you'll be working with a substance use disorder professional who might be doing individual sessions or running a group. But that person is really there, as I said before, to create that individualized treatment plan for the individual to make sure that we are able to be as successful as possible in supporting them through the process. Next slide. So here in King County, we have about 23 outpatient providers across the county. We also have four medication for opioid use disorder providers. And those were some of the ones that, that Brad was talking about. And I wanna be clear here what this, this means is right now these four are for methadone specific treatment. And there's actually a bullet missing here, I apologize. There should be another bullet here that says, um, in addition to those four methadone providers in King County, we actually have over 160, 160 access points for those that are also um, needing buprenorphine or norlox naltrexine uh, for um, opioid use disorder treatment. So um, there are uh, many ways to gain access to the opioid treatment that Brad was mentioning earlier. And for outpatient services, one just needs to call the provider directly to enroll in services. And this uh, slide here, if you're not sure which provider to call, tells you about our website that you can go and look up the provider in your area or in the area of your choice. Um, and it gives you information on how to contact and set up an appointment. And then again, I've given you our a client services number, you'll see it a couple more times because I really want to make sure people have that number if you need our assistance or you have questions. So for outpatient services, we do have that website search component. Next slide. 
And for outpatient, I also want to just tie back um, some resources that you heard about a little earlier from Heather talking from the King County Recovery Coalition. She mentioned a couple of our peer providers in our community, and I can't stress enough the value that they bring to supporting um, those in, in uh, treatment, as well as those that may not be ready for treatment. We know that traditional treatment may not be um, the right fit for someone at that time. And so we do have these peer network um, programs that are supportive in the community and really wrapping um, support around individuals. Recovery Cafe has two locations in King County. Peer Washington has two in King County in Seattle and Kent, as well as Spokane and Olympia outside of King County. So um, please engage with our peer network, become, if you are a peer, uh, join the movement of supporting our uh, communities and being there for um, individuals who are in recovery. Next slide. Residential services or inpatient residential um, is available through about 27 different sites. We have six here in King County that has 22, over 224 beds for inpatient care. And there are 21 other sites across the rest of the state with about 868 beds. Uh, King County contracts with all of those facilities. And so a King County resident uh, can access any of those sites. So please let us know if you, um, some people choose to go to a different facility outside of King County. And so if that is the case and you need assistance with that, again, contact us and we can help you with that. Uh, but there, we have access to hundreds of beds for inpatient residential treatment. And that includes adults and, a youth, and youth. Next slide. When you do inpatient residential treatment, um, you do get intensive on-site services because you stay there for several days, if not weeks, perhaps months. You also can get co-occurring disorder treatment and that's for individuals who have not only the addiction services need, but also mental health treatment needs. And then we have specific programs for um, uh, individuals such as for pregnant and parenting women. So please make sure if you're looking for an inpatient program and maybe it's for a specific population or a need, again, contact us and we can help you walk through that and let you know who those providers are and help connect you to those providers. Next slide. So how do you get into inpatient residential? Well, again, let us help you. Give us a call. You can also contact the residential provider directly, or you can have an outpatient SUD provider help you. Many people are in outpatient services and it is determined that perhaps the next step is to go inpatient. And if you have an outpatient provider, they can help make that referral and transition for you. And then they, you have a discharge plan back to that outpatient provider that is um, uh, developed in partnership and available when you are done with your patient services. Next slide. Acute withdrawal management. This is known as detox. And um, detox is for individuals using substances daily who just can't stop. Um, and we, we've heard that, you know, we know that there are people that are drinking to excess or using um, substances and uh, may want to stop, but they just cannot stop on their own. And so detox is a place for individuals to go, get the support that they need immediately in an intense environment, um, or for those that are actually going through withdrawal symptoms as they attempt to stop and taper down on their own. It's a medically supervised environment where you can be safe and you know that then you can go from there to a, a treatment um, program um, safely. So in um, across Washington, we have three acute withdrawal management locations. One is in King County and two are outside of King County. One can self-refer or you can be referred by um, other STD providers or others as well, including King County. We can help make that referral for you. Detox services are available 24 seven. And as I said, you will be screened for and referred for treatment follow-up upon discharge from detox. Next slide. Secure detox. So this is where individuals recently, we've been able to build and develop secure detox facilities across Washington. This is where individuals are sent um, involuntarily if they are in a crisis where there is present or imminent harm as a result of substance use disorder. So here in uh, Washington, to get into an involuntary withdrawal management program, 
you must go through the designated crisis responders. Those are a team that work in my division and they go out and do involuntary assessments for mental health and substance use disorder needs. We have three secure detox locations in Washington, one here in King County that has 16 beds, one in Chehalis and one in Spokane. And again, that needs to go through our designated crisis responders, um, but making a referral is as easy as calling crisis connections and they connect you with the uh, DCRs who will then take the information down and start looking into the situation and then assessing the individual if they need to go into secure detox um, uh, um, against their wishes. Uh, but we know that is the safest place for them. They need to go into that setting to get um, uh, detoxified and um, observed while they are going through withdrawal. So um, if you do need to send, make a referral, please go through Crisis Connections and contact our designated crisis responders. There's, that's okay, you can go. There's a couple of other crisis teams I want you to be aware of here in King County. Next slide. We are fortunate to have a sobering center here in King County. This is run as well by a team that, that is under my division. Uh, the sobering center is a safe facility for individuals 18 and over that need to go somewhere to sleep off the effects of alcohol and inebriation. And it really serves as a community diversion option for emergency rooms and first responders. We don't want or need them to go to those places because um, uh, they are taking up beds perhaps for others, but also because at the sobering center, you have staff and um, individuals who are trained in working with individuals who are intoxicated and inebriated. So the sobering center is really um, a safe place for for individuals to go. And it provides an opportunity for that individual to get assistance and really start thinking about and exploring future treatment options. They serve up to 30 individuals in the course of their day. Um, they're open 24-7. Uh, Next slide. Oh. Okay. Did we have other slides? We're checking to see if not, I can speak to them. Sure, go ahead, yeah, oh, speak to those. Okay, slides. the other slide I wanna talk about was our emergency service patrol. And that is also through um, our division here at King County. Um, this is a team that drives around King County in equipped vehicles, vans, um, looking for individuals, um, usually at night, but um, also during the day, that may need assistance because they are um, intoxicated and uh, they are able to provide transportation to a safe location uh, for that individual. Um, sometimes it's going to detox, sometimes it's going to the sobering center. Other times they may be just taking them home to a place where they, they need to get to. Uh, we wanna make sure people are getting home safe. On average, they pick up and contact over 2,200 people a month. And of those, they transport around 1,400 of those to secure locations and treatment. So that's our emergency service patrol. Um, and then finally, just a, a, another um, mention of crisis connections because they are our 24 hour crisis line that takes in any calls from the community. If you're not sure who to call and you have a crisis, please make sure that you call the crisis line. They can help um, uh, triage and then also determine who to send the call to. Most of my teams, which are 24 seven um, are constantly um, getting referrals and calls from them, and then we determine what kind of response is needed. So that's a really quick overview of our out, of our um, SUD services and how to access them. And again, just please, if you have any questions, feel free to use and call our, our client services line. We, we are here to help and answer questions and um, most importantly, help people engage in treatment because again, we know treatment works and recovery can happen. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks so much, Brad and Kelly, for that wonderful presentation. I sure appreciate it. I, uh, I just, I, I guess I, I wish, you know, I had known about these resources when I first got to a place where I finally got it in my thick skull that I needed them. Uh, when I went from what's called pre-contemplative to contemplative. Um, and it took me a long time to understand all of the jargon and all the all what, what all this means. But uh, later in life, I learned of them because I did inpatient and was uh, discharged in, in 2012. And then I had a handful of relapses 
20, the, like the term that I was reelected to in 2013, that term of office, I had a handful of relaxes after, you know, in one case, uh, more than a year of sobriety. And, uh, and instead of going to inpatient, those relapses were almost like aftershocks to an earthquake. Like they kind of hit and they spread themselves out. Um, and I pray <laughs> don't happen again, but, but what happened was I actually got a chance early on to see a detox up close and personal to see inpatient and then later on to see outpatient and to understand that, Hey, I can still keep my job and work um, and do outpatient at the same time and benefit from the services that are provided there. And, uh, you know, I'll, I, I just, I'm so glad those services exist and they're different. They, depending on where you are in your, your journey through recovery is when you might use them. So Kelly, I guess I, I have some questions that are coming in from people. I think, let me just ask this general question. I think it'll be on people's minds is, okay, I got a number I can call to try and get somebody that I care about in to treatment. How am I going to pay for this? What is, what is, what do, what do you see most often? What are options people have? How can they afford this? Because sometimes this is, this can be a big expense. Sure. Um, well, for the King County services, uh, all of the programs I described uh, are uh, paid for through Medicaid. And so if someone is on Medicaid, um, that is a resource for them. Um, all of these agencies as well do um, sliding scale if you don't have Medicaid or if you don't have insurance. Um, and we work with all of them to make sure that they have resources through our mid dollars and through other mechanisms um, to support being able to serve individuals. We really like to be able to offer services regardless of, of funding and background, financial background, because we know the value of treatment and the importance of it. Um, so again, it's if you're in a situation where that's not um, looking very doable, again, I encourage people to call us because we very much want to work with you to make sure that we're finding you a provider that is um, you know, gonna meet your needs, but also they all know, providers know, they're in this work for a reason. They're in this work because they have the huge desire, just like all of us, to provide services and treatment to our community. And so um, you know, we wanna make sure people have the opportunity to work through some of those barriers. Uh, but Medicaid, for sure, um, any of the managed care plans, the five managed care plans that I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, again, we, we try to pull together different funding resources, MID and others, um, to support uh, provide, paying for programs so that the person does, that doesn't have to be the barrier. Can I add to that real quick? Yeah, Brad. Thank you so much. And Kelly, thank you. And thank you for all the services. Uh, you know, one of the things that Kelly and I have worked so hard together on, you know, throughout the years is no wrong door and no wrong way to enter the door. And so providing access at so many different places. And so, because sometimes as you know, they talk about in recovery that the 500 pound phone telephone about picking how difficult it is to pick up the telephone, but there's so many places along the care provider continuum that can help people access these treatment and services. So whether it is, you know, a peer network as Kelly and Heather were talking about, or even a primary care provider can also do a ton of work. We have a network, we have an amazing network of community health centers across the, across the county and across the state um, that really can provide access into a lot of these treatment services. As Kelly and Leo were talking about the integrated care network of integrating behavioral health and primary care together. We have programs like uh, like the Navos Public Health Primary Care Partnership um, down in Burien um, and a lot of different access points. So it, it's really just about never um, being afraid to, to ask for help. Um, and Kelly's, the phone numbers that Kelly put up, we want, we want to make that front door as wide and easily available as possible for people. Yeah, that's really good. I remember I, uh, I actually called the treatment facility uh, when I realized that I, I had a significant problem that I wasn't able to stop. But I remember I got a number that wasn't as scary as I thought, but it was still a pretty uh, big financial nut at that time. This is a facility that I wanted to go to in, the other, in Eastern Washington. But, but um, you know, 
when people are, are, are using or drinking, they don't make the best financial decisions, right? And maybe they've been laid off work or had other adverse financial collection agencies. There. So when they're ready to go into treatment, they're really at the financial bottom of a ravine there. And one thing I've learned is that sobriety makes your financial life get a lot better. I mean, because you're making smart choices and all of those other things. So, but it's when they need it the most is right when they need to get in. And it's also the hardest to afford because they're down on their, in, in, in the throes of addiction. So I think the most important thing that we can take from this is people are going to do whatever they can to try and help here. And, and for my part, you know, whatever we don't have, we should consider adding in as a matter of public policy, because as you said, Brad, the widest door possible, if somebody has a genuine desire to get sober, and even if they don't, we need to find a way to pay for that. And uh, we need to find a way to get them in the door for the treatment, because if you look at the economic um, estimates, some say as much as 10% of the economy in the United States is affected negatively by uh, addiction to drugs and alcohol, you know, loss of work and wages and all the other stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious issue and society's better with the initial front end investment. Um, I got another question that, uh, from one of the folks here, um, and I think it's more on the side of grant funding, but uh, how do I access funding through King County to help with the homeless addiction work that I am doing? Any kind of grant programs out there that exist that either of you could speak to? I think that um, I, you know, I'm certainly uh, inviting anyone who wants to give us a call and we can talk through some of that. We um, put out different opportunities and we also track and monitor um, not King County opportunities, but those that are in the community. Um, so happy to have conversations about that. In particular, the intersection between um, substance use and homelessness. Uh, we have as part of our DCHS department, uh, we have a whole housing and homelessness division. Um, so behavioral health is the, the one that I work in is, is one division of five. And um, I know that they are always looking and tracking that as well. And we can put you in touch with people there uh, because we wanna make sure that any of these opportunities, all of these opportunities are communicated broadly um, and also in an equitable and uh, fair way um, so that, that all providers and all individuals doing this work, which we totally, so much appreciate, um, have access to funding um, to be able to continue the great work they're doing. And one of the ways to ensure that that's done equitably is to really track and monitor that um, and make sure there's communication about it. So we're happy to, if you wanna contact me or contact us, we're happy to make sure that you're in connection with the right people. The other thing I would say real quick is to make sure that you're signed up through the county for RFP proposals. Um, there was, um, uh, recent um, funds released through the through the mid um, around small grant programs and rural grants. And I think it was the mid, I apologize if it wasn't, but I know that there was just a recent listening session um, that was around rural um, behavioral health care needs. And so just to make sure that you're signed up for county, um, county funding opportunities and announcements, that's where a lot of that goes out. And um, there's a lot that Kelly's um, division does and behavioral health division, there's a lot that, that's going on around the equity and social justice work at the county um, and through public health that you'll get uh, notifications when those go out. And a great uh, example, as Brad just mentioned, was the rural uh, focus on rural, which uh, Council Member Dunn and Leo mentioned as well. We just closed the rural survey that was out for several weeks um, that went out to, to anyone who wanted to respond, providers, community members, family members, and uh, we really wanted to hear what, what the needs were in rural parts of King County so that we can take that feedback and really direct the resources um, to expand access and to make, um, you know, as Brad said, that door as wide as possible. We're really excited. Those results are just coming in and getting tabulated. And I think it's gonna be a really great way for us to know um, very specifically how we can turn around and fund and, grant, and provide those grants to um, you know, organizations in the rural areas. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Brad. One, one last question here. We got just a minute or two. Uh, it's a technical question. It's not in my area of expertise, but uh, is there a better way to distribute methadone? An addict finds it onerous to go every day to get a dose. I don't know if anyone knows. I don't know what the process is, but could you respond to that for me, please? 
Yeah, I can take that. So, sure. um, so there's, there's three medications for uh, opiate use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Uh, buprenorphine and methadone are the gold standards. Caleb might be talking about it. I see him on video coming up next. Um, but uh, method, it's due to the federal regulation. So due to the federal regulations, methadone has to be uh, distributed um, through method, standalone methadone clinics. And um, we have done a tremendous amount to expand access to methadone, especially in South King County um, as uh, evidence-based medication over the past seven years. We've, we now have three uh, providers in South King County, seven across the county um, to do methadone. Buprenorphine um, can be done at the doctor's office. So that's why we put so much emphasis, emphasis on buprenorphine expansion, not only at doctor's offices, but we're expanding buprenorphine in the jail for people of opiate use disorder and other low barrier locations where people people with opiate use disorder are, unfortunately, due to the federal regulations, and it's been raised many times at the federal level, um, were handcuffed a little bit. But there are also mobile methadone vans that um, Evergreen Treatment Services has that, um, you know, prior to COVID were uh, a little bit more abundant out in the community. But we're, we, we, it is definitely a point of federal interest to, to, to try to expand access to methadone. Thank you so much, Brad, for that response. I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you both, Kelly and Brad, for your hard work uh, and your leadership in this important issue uh, as we continue to fight with this, this as you saw, the increasing, Brad, the very interesting data there. I mean, that jump of more than 100 people in overdoses is considerable, and it's obviously a problem facing us. I, if it weren't, we wouldn't have 200 people on this signed up for this conference as well. So thanks for your leadership.